Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Let's face it, the future is now. We're living in a connected cyber society, and we need to stop ignoring it or pretending that it's not affecting us. Join us as we explore how humanity arrived at this current state of digital reality and what it means to live amongst so much technology and data. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. And we are recording, uh, I think this is number three today, so a uh, busy day here in uh, <laughs> at ITSP Magazine, in particular on Redefining Society podcast, which as I guess when I started this show, we're not going to run out of topics. Uh, when you put society and technology together and then you sprinkle a little bit of cybersecurity on top of that, um, you can talk about pretty much everything. So <laughs> I'm glad for all the people listening and uh, mostly I'm glad for all the amazing guests that I can bring on the show. And as usual, if you're listening to the audio uh, version, you don't know who is on yet. Well, maybe you read the title, uh, but if you're watching the video, you see that Tom Kemp is with me and uh, I'm very honored. I'm very honored to have you on, Tom, and to have this conversation about the book that uh, it's about to go public. So let's uh, talk about that, but let's talk about you first. Who is Tom Kemp? Well, first of all, Marco, thanks for having me on. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, no, I'm a Silicon Valley-based entrepreneur, and uh, I founded, uh, co-founded with a great uh, teammates, two companies, one that went public and uh, a cybersecurity company called Centrify that was acquired a few years ago. And then since then, I've been doing angel investing. So I actually have 15 investments in various tech companies, some of which are in privacy, some of which are in cybersecurity, some focused on consumers, some on the enterprise, uh, but also over the last few years have been heavily getting into public policy. I, I feel I have some great expertise in in real world matters and uh, see what uh, enterprises and consumers are dealing with as a respect to privacy and cybersecurity. So I've been very active uh, from a political perspective, trying to get uh, laws passed. And so I worked on Proposition 24 in California, the California Privacy Rights Act. And just recently I co-authored a bill called the California Delete Act that uh, would give consumers a single click to be able to say, hey, data brokers, delete my data as well. So kind of all the above uh, has eventually led me to uh, write this book called Containing Big Tech. Which is a big story in a short title already, right? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, uh, I don't even know where to start. Uh, so I like that you said you were involved in this privacy um, act. Um, of course, me, even if I've been living in the U.S. for such a long time, I'm uh, from Florence, Italy, European. And uh, when I go over there for a reason or another, it's always interesting to see um, how the European community has been a little bit more aggressive, definitely, than than here in the U.S. The GDPR, of course, has been kind of leading the, the way. So it, it's nice to see that it catch up. But I always feel like, are we just keep putting um, 
corks in the bottom of the boat that is actually bringing water. So we do an act here, an act there, just to try to contain privacy. But also, I don't want to sound negative because I'm not, but aren't we too late? And I think this is the big, com the big question for, for you because it sounds to me that you're probably thinking we're not from the title. Well, I, I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, Europe has led the way as it relates to privacy, and they're still leading the way. For example, uh, right now in Europe, there's this thing called the AI Act. And so they're, they're, they're much further ahead of the US. And so it's people call it the Brussels effect. Um, and probably where uh, the consumer protection as it relates to privacy and cybersecurity is is initially taking a hold is, is in California. And so then people call it the California effect as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's oftentimes it's a game of whack of mole, right? Where um, you didn't really think that this would become a problem. I think the best example is just overall privacy um, in terms of, you know, when, I mean, obviously Google and Facebook now called Meta, uh, the vast majority of the revenue is advertising. They're, they're advertising companies. And so we made an agreement as consumers with those companies that we would give up our personal information and get all these great free services. And in the past, it was about, you know, hey, okay, I would get some of these ads and maybe some of these ads are annoying. Some, sometimes the ads are, are actually helpful, et cetera. But what's really happened over the last five, 10 years is that a lot of this data that has been collected about us can now be weaponized against us as well. Um, and so it, we now need to start addressing that. And what's been happening in the US, it's been being addressed at the state level, um, kind of in a patchwork manner. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the United States does not have a federal equivalent of, of GDPR, um, which is kind of scary given the fact that, you know, Google went public, you know, what, 20 plus years ago, same thing with uh, Meta, uh, et cetera. And some of our even existing privacy laws, such as HIPAA, have not been updated since the 90s. Um, and of course, there is an explosion of healthcare related data that's a very sensitive nature that's not covered by HIPAA because it's on mobile apps as well. So uh, we need to do something. Uh, it's happening at the state level. Uh, as of last year, there were five states that had privacy laws. Now there's a couple more, but it's a huge patchwork. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we do need to do something to keep up with the changes in technology, just much like from, a, uh, you know, protecting consumers that, you know, with automobile safety, eventually there was there wasn't any, but then they added, you know, seatbelts, wipers, uh, etc. And, you know, no one com complains anymore about, uh, you know, automobile safety rules and, and whatnot. And, you know, we're, we're still early stage when it comes to consumer privacy in the U.S. That's a that's a really good point because sometimes, especially if you're in the cybersecurity industry, you feel like, oh, we've been talking about these things forever. But then you think about it and it's like, it's not really forever. I mean, it's a relatively new industry still nowadays, like our online life, our digital life and, and looking at society. I mean, I just had a conversation a few days ago about how to prepare the next generation and how to educate them into using the, the devices that we have and if it's okay to use apps that follow them around. And so maybe the parents are a little bit overprotecting. And the question when you look at from a cybersecurity perspective is, apart from the relationship in the family, we're talking about are those data possibly going to go end up in bad hands and have many consequences? So weaponizing the data, what, what do you... What do you mean by that? Yeah. So in the past, the data collection was about, you know, to facilitate advertising. Um, but I think what people realize that the data could be used for other reasons, right? And one, re one way, especially with data collected by entities known as data brokers that we don't have a direct relationship with, that that data could actually be used to facilitate identity theft, right? Because 
you know, basically all your answers of your personal questions that you have to identify who you are, are known to data brokers, what high school you went to, what's your first car, uh, you know, what are your last five addresses, um, et cetera. And uh, so that's one aspect where, you know, that the, the hackers are getting really smart of leveraging personal data to be able to either answer the questions and get in and, and impersonate you um, or to fish you by uh, going in and potentially attacking executives by going in and figuring out what their personal accounts are, going into their Gmail and then kind of using that as a hook into the, to the enterprise. Other examples of weaponization of information include by getting to know you so well that they can actually start serving up ads that kind of influence and change your behavior, um, et cetera. And so, and it can actually, you know, get some people fall into rabbit holes uh, where they're, they're served up certain information or they may be prone and they don't even realize it to be manipulated um, as well because they're leveraging that data. And then there's also for certain people that, you can buy data through data brokers to get around subpoenas. Like you can basically get around the fourth amendment by, Hey, I want to know what this person, where they visited, where they went, et cetera, before you would have to get a subpoena to, to figure that information by subpoenaing uh, the phone companies, et cetera. But now you can go to a data broker and it's pretty easy to figure out what people's mobile advertising ID on their phone is, and then correlate it that with their location information. So you can completely track and basically go around the fourth amendment. Amendment. And then finally, we are in an interesting time. We're basically in a post-abortion rights America right now where people can subpoena or get information from uh, Google or from data brokers that may give you insight in terms of the reproductive choices that you may have made. And that's now criminalized where it wasn't in the past. So data, certain aspects of data wasn't criminal ability to be used criminal, but because the law uh, with Roe v. Wade going away with the Dobbs decision. So there's multiple aspects of how personal data can be weaponized. It first starts, of course, with identity theft, right? But then it goes around subverting the Fourth Amendment. It goes to potentially leveraging AI uh, and that data feed to change or manipulate your behavior and maybe even subtle manners uh, and then eventually gets to the point where this type of data could be subpoenaed and used against you based on specific choices oh and one last thing is the data could also be used to discriminate against you for example if you're maybe a awful employer and you do not want to hire someone that's either pregnant or potentially has cancer, you can actually go through a, a list of data broker in data information and they collect that type or they infer that information and you can make your hiring decisions based on uh, doing a third party uh, data purchase and seeing what type of data is associated with an individual before you're hiring them and, and try to kind of work around some of the discrimination laws that we have in the US. So that's very possible as well. That's a handful right there. Uh, it reminds me of a quote of Cardinal Richelieu back in the 1700, where he says, give me a letter of the most honorable man, and I'll find in there something to incriminate it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. bring it now to the amount of these letters that we have, you know, uh, air quote letters. And I mean, we, we're in trouble. Plus, add in artificial intelligence just to make it even more interesting. And who knows what? Yeah, I think, but also just from a human perspective that we go through in life, we, we go through a process of trying to discover who we are, what we like, what friends we are. We may not be sure about our sexuality, our religious beliefs, et cetera, right? And so we do a lot of exploration. And in the past, maybe it was going to the library and getting books or talking with friends, but no one had a, a record of that, right? And now, as you go through that self-discovery process, that everything's being recorded and captured, right? And I, it, it's the equivalent of always having, you know, it's like that, that TV show Big Brother when you're constantly mm -hmm. being recorded. And that does change you if you're aware of that, that, that you become more self-conscious and maybe you're not as interested in, in doing something. And look, I understand that, that a lot of people say, hey, I don't have anything to, okay, you know, I don't have anything to hide, right? But yeah, but, but 
but some people could actually use that for nefarious purposes, like what we talked about before, like identity theft, right? To, mm-hmm. to fish you or to, to, to use that to figure out your password or your, your security questions, et cetera. So it does have a negative impact uh, on you as well. But uh, we need to move to a regime where the users can, can take control of who they give their data and, and provide you know, kind of governance beyond it. And that's the definition of online privacy. And then, of course, security is about if someone steals that information, right? right. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's a difference. It, privacy does not equal cybersecurity. They're 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 kind of they, they overlap in some areas, right? Because uh, it's it, it's it's privacy is about governance. Uh, security is about pr- security integrity and protecting the information. But but there is overlap, and we need to kind of factor both in uh, when we look at data associated with, with ourselves. Yeah, definitely a lot to think about. And and when you when you started and you mentioned the advertising model into you know the the digital marketing, you say the word agreement, meaning the consumer agrees to exchange the service for something, which is giving away their information. My I think that nobody really, or only few, actually made that agreement intentionally, right? It's been more of a lawyered in, and then <laughs> you become the product, and you're not the users anymore. And uh, so I, I don't know how you can get it back, even with education and everything. I mean, do you think that if we announce this act, if we if we bring the regulation? I always this this feeling that sure your your taste may change who you are today maybe it's not who you were but they can still say this was you when you were uh, students and you maybe you were drinking you were having fun you were doing something it's still you so can we actually really take it back because I think that's the big question actually I think you can I mean but you're absolutely you right can. look I mean it, it, you know when they 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 give you these huge end user license agreement. I mean, who 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 the heck reads the Apple and Apple end user license agreement? It's like six pages, uh, et cetera. You just go click, right? It's uh, or they they put dark patterns up to kind of fool mm-hmm. you or make it so difficult as well. Um, and in fact, we even have situations today that uh, and increasingly they're becoming more AI oriented. That it may take two steps up to sign up for a subscription, but it may take 10 or 20 steps to unsubscribe. And we need to basically say, we need, we need legislation or regulation that says, if it takes three steps to sign up, sign up, you, you should be able to be given the same number of steps to, to unsubscribe from a service, be it Amazon prime or, or, or Dropbox or, or whatever. I mean, so that's, th- there are some dark patterns, but there's actually, well, first of all, to, to, take control and, and to ensure this doesn't happen, first, you do need a federal privacy law that gives you the right to delete, the right to say no, to just the right to know what data is being collected about you. But then the tech industry actually has started like saying, oh, okay, well, we'll actually start suggesting state laws because we know it's going to be so darn difficult for consumers to exercise those rights. But there's actually mm-hmm. a solution. They're, they're, the first solution is something called gr- global privacy control. It's basically a signal that you can put on your browser. It eventually needs to be put in place on mobile that basically says, as I visit websites, et cetera, I'm going to have a flag set up, a signal that says, do not sell or share my information or limit the use of any sensitive information that you collect. So it's called GPC. Uh, it, it's not... California is trying to mandate um, that industry is pushing back. But if we all of a sudden have a signal on our phone or on our browser mm-hmm. that says, don't collect, don't sell, that solves a lot of the problems. So that's, but those are with people that we d- interface directly with. That's with, you know, Google or Walmart or whatever websites that we visit or mobile apps. But then there's a third party data, which is collected by data brokers. Data brokers are entities that we don't have a business relationship or a direct relationship with, but they collect behind the scenes all this information, our credit card transactions, what websites, um, they have SDKs uh, tied into mobile apps that know what we do inside the app, et cetera. And so what we need for third party data is the equivalent of the FDC 
do not call registry where you can just go to a website and say, delete my data um, and do not track me moving forward for those third parties as well. That's actually what I proposed in California with this thing called the California Delete Act that would give uh, consumers in California a single port portal where they can just put their email address or, or mailing address, hit click, um, et cetera. So ironically, we could do a lot. I mean, A, you first you need a federal privacy law if you don't have, you know, but maybe you're fortunate to live in a state like California that has one. You need the enforcement of global privacy control that has that signal or flag that says, do not sell my, my data. That's just like the baseline whenever you, and then the, th the third thing is, is we need the, the equivalent of an FDC do not call registry, but in this case for data brokers, um, et cetera. But if we get those building blocks in place, wow, we could have significant control over how our data is used and basically telling people, I just don't want my data to be sold or shared. And uh, so it's possible, it, it's, it's there. And, uh, and I think we're in going to back to GDPR, there's a thing called cookie fatigue, right? Right. Yes. Where, you know, you constantly, every website, uh, accept the cookies. And then if you say, if you select something, well, what about performance cookies? What about analytics cookies? What about marketing? Like, oh God. Okay. Just fine. Track me or whatever. But yep. if we could just have, if we could just have a signal at our browser that says, boom, right. You know, I don't want to be tracked period. And so you get out of the whole cookie business, the cookie fatigue as well. And, and frankly, you know, tech companies who are based on advertising, they like that fatigue because people break down and, and we just need to make it easier for people as well. And, and that's why I just kind of, just based on my years of looking at cybersecurity and privacy, that's the first couple chapters in my book containing big tech, because I just wanted to say, actually, there turns out there could be some pretty easy solutions here. We did something similar with the the uh, telemarketers with Do Not Call. It's not perfect, but at least it's something. It's 250 million Americans have signed up for it. There are federal privacy laws, but you just got to fix them so you don't get the cookie fatigue. So there are things you could do. And, uh, and so that, that's why I wanted to evangelize based on, you know, my 20 plus years of real world cybersecurity and privacy expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you and it will be a really good thing, especially because then you, you really have an agreement where you easily can say yes, say no, and maybe who knows, you get something back, which is if they know who I am and what my taste is and I go on Amazon per se, and they suggest me some product, they're probably right. They know enough. But so convenience versus privacy, that's uh, that's a big thing. You you bring the AI in this conversation. I think it's right after you talk about weaponizing uh, the, the data. Everybody now is talking AI. I just got back from RSA conference. <laughs> like, if you have a drink yeah. every time somebody say artificial intelligence, <laughs> especially generative one, you're gonna you're gonna not last long. So, how how do you see this coming into? I mean, obviously there is a million topics around AI, from copyrights to harvesting of information to uh, losing jobs and 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 so forth. A lot of good things too. You know, AI, it's a powerful tool. How does it play in, in your vision, in your book, in the big tech container? Yeah, well, look, big tech, I mean, AI is, can be incredibly positive. And, and by the way, you know, just, it's incredibly positive to have a, you know, some global uh, social media networks, et cetera. It just, I think people just need more say in how their data is being used. Um, but in the case of AI, there's there's a lot of good things uh, in terms of, I mean, if you drive a Tesla, you know, to be able to identify, uh, you know, tell you, you know, how close you are to a, a, a bumper or a sign or something walking across the street as a person or a bike or something like that. I think we can, and then, of course, like from a medical perspective, the ability to do a better job of analyzing uh, test results, uh, et cetera, and, and, and increasing the chances. So I, I want to be very clear that AI is a very, can be a very positive thing. And the reality is the majority of AI implementation is going to have to do with 
automated decision making, just try to provide better decision making, better analysis, um, et cetera. A lot of the hype has to do with the generative AI, right? But the majority of AI usage uh, is going to be just to help facilitate uh, you know, decision making, um, et cetera. Um, specific to generative AI, Actually, I have a couple, I, just like I said before, I think there's some simple solutions um, as it relates to the privacy thing. I think as it relates to generative AI, uh, one idea that I have is for the large providers of generative AI, that from a regulation perspective, it should be allowed to be able to take text or picture and be able to go to their website and, and ask them, did you generate this? Etc. So I think we really need more transparency for people to verify and validate if they actually had created um, the, the the images, the text, uh, etc. Right. And so I think that uh, another example that of a potential solution is that when you're dealing with you know, on a phone call or a chat you should have actually the right to say, hey, is this AI or is this a human? Because oftentimes we just don't know, right? And it's kind of a 411, like in the middle of a chat, you can hit star 411 and it's, it's it has to fess up uh, if this is actually you're dealing with AI. And then from there, you should be able to have the ability to request to talk to a human uh, as well. And in fact, GDPR has this, that you do have the right to be able for certain automated decisions, you do have the right to appeal to a human. And I think we also need to add that um, to overall AI. So I think there needs to be more transparency as it relates to AI, especially generative AI, to be able to ask if, you know, BARD or OpenAI uh, chat GPT has actually generated this. And so you can just create a simple law that says if you have more than 10 million monthly users uh, and you, you generate stuff that, that your service needs a slash verify where people can upload something. And that would resolve a lot of the issues with uh, kids and homework, right? Um, I have a funny story that a, a family uh, friend, their daughter was a senior and she was asked to write uh, an essay in her high school about what's the best way you know one should get into college. And she wrote a very humorous essay that says, "Oh, I need to move to Montana. I need to learn the bassoon. You know, just kind of you know, all these edge cases, so she would have a mm -hmm. higher chance of getting into a great college." And her high school teacher accused her of using chat GPT to write this because it was too funny. The essay was too funny, too humorous, et cetera. Well, why not be able to take that essay? The teacher could take that essay and just go to, you know, chat GT slash verify, upload it and say, did you generate it? And, and, and at what time? I, I think that would resolve a lot of the concerns and issues that uh, getting these people to fess up uh, whether or not they generate as well. So again, it turns out there's some pretty simple ways to go about doing this. Like, you know, are we, oh, we're so worried about if, is this AI generated? Well, ask, we should be able to ask, did you generate this or not? Yes or no? Seems pretty simple. Yeah, and it also comes to the same root, which is knowledge and being able to decide, do I want to deal with an AI or not? Because in some cases, maybe you do want to. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's like, like, yeah, who, who wants to spend like half hour waiting to talk to someone? And sometimes based on the large data models that were fed to the AI that like, hey, I have a error with my refrigerator. I go to the online chat bot and I put in the error messages. They ask me for 10 different things and they've got the entirety of all the issues that have come in and, and, and in theory and as opposed to like waiting a half hour for some technician that may not know your model of a refrigerator, et cetera. But or, or that or tells you to unplug the computer and plug it back again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, lo and lose your session. And, and so, <laughs> but, 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 but the funny thing is, but as you're going through that process, you, you, sometimes people, they fool you. They don't tell you, they actually give you the, like, hi, I'm Alice. I'm here to help you. And then you're, wait a minute, like, is this really Alice? Is this really a human? Like, I should mm -hmm. be able to type star 411 
you know, give me the info. And then like Alice is, and it should return. Alice is a uh, AI generated software program if you want to speak to a real human put star 911 right and then you, you put that in the chat bot i mean so or, there, there or should... how about just say hello this is alice i am an ai <laughs> make it even yes easier for like me, right? that you should be able to or here's another example that for maybe websites that have over 10 million monthly average users that there should be like in the upper right hand corner a little nutrition label that tells you what percent of this uh, page was generated by AI. You know, 82% of this was generated by AI, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's yeah. good. Because, I mean, we have food nutrition labels, right? And I know, like, Apple um, has requires mobile app application developers to put privacy nutrition labels like what do you collect and all that stuff and and frankly we need that across the board every major app vendor even if they're on apple or not you know should have a privacy nutrition label in terms of what information they collect how they use it and should be in a simple you know form as opposed to this huge 10 page legalese but we should also have an ai nutrition label which which simply tells us what percent of this was actually generated by humans versus ai um and that would be very good to know um that you know the credibility and then you could actually potentially weigh the 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 in in search engines you could use that as a factor in terms of your ranking of the actual uh, page itself, if you elect to do that from a search engine perspective, um, or that could potentially help, um, you know, students or academia to know that, hey, I'm quoting this article, I want to know if I'm actually quoting a human or if I'm quoting, you know, AI, etc. So I think we need, need mm -hmm. more transparency when it comes to AI. And that actually resolves a lot of the issues as well. So again, you know, to me, it's like, Everyone you know, waves their hands and all that stuff. And I'm like, dudes, you know, just if you're worried about something being AI generated, require Bard and Open G Chat GPT from OpenAI to tell you if they generated it or not. Then that would address like the whole college and high school, uh, you know, issue of, you know, is this really this kid's essay, um, you know, who was being very cute and funny about saying I'm going to move to Montana and learn the bassoon and that's how I'm going to get into Harvard? Or was it actually, uh, you know, ChatGPT that generated a humorous essay on how to best get into college? Yeah. And you, you can have transparency there as well as say, hey, I did my research and I get some input from AI, but then I develop it on my own. So here it is, 20% AI and 80% my brain, right? Yeah. Um, as we start closing, I know that you have another relevant um, topic, kind of like the, the third part of your book talks about big tech and how you see this to be something that is making competition. I know you're also an investor so in tech uh, having your own company before and investing in other can you uh explain why you felt the need to on top of data weaponization brokers and and ai to add this chapter where you talk about the presence of this big shadow <laughs> all, all yeah. over the tech world well look the the reality is is that the the five largest tech players are monopolies or in certain markets digital markets or they're duopolist i mean th they may say oh well you know if you add up the whole if you add up libraries uh, and card catalogs and libraries that, you know, we only have a 20% market share in search. Well, no, but in internet search, Google is the dominant player, right? In mobile uh, app stores and operating system, it's a duopoly. It's Google and Apple, right? Um, and the problem is, is that there's approximately about 10 digital markets. These are huge markets where it's basically kill zones for any startups to try to, to enter. And the problem is, is that these large enterprises as part of these digital markets have built marketplaces where they're the market, they provide the marketplace, but they're also participating in the markets as well, right? Which means like, take for example, 
Amazon. They obviously provide an incredible, you know, dot com, uh, e-commerce site, etc. But they're able to figure out like what are the hot products from third parties and it and in getting that data they can actually say oh we're we're going to come out with a knockoff on this as well and so they're able to through the by, by owning the market they're able to actually um, come out with amazon basics and other knockoffs etc and kind of kill off popular products as well so they participate in the market they own the marketplace another example of that is in the app stores right that the app store providers, they know exactly what are the popular apps and what they can do, or in the case of Google with the search engine, they can see what are the popular vertical searches. They can come out with their own solution. They could put it at the top. They can either put their apps at the top, their, you know, or they can put the, their search results specific to their properties at the top as well. And so it actually kills off companies because they, they own the marketplace. And then from there, they actually charge 30% in the case of the uh, the mobile app stores. They take 30% of your, your, your revenue just to be in the marketplace and sell in the marketplace. And so if you're Spotify trying to get into the audiobooks market, you have to pay that 30% tax to Apple or Google with Android to offer an audiobook, but Apple or Google doesn't have to charge that extra 30%. So it, it's almost insane to create a business that's going to try to sell mobile apps, and that's your primary way of making money, because immediately 30% of your top line goes to the marketplace vendor as well. And if you look at Apple, I mean, they only they make billions of dollars in their app store, but they only spend about you know a couple hundred million dollars you know, to validate these apps and all that stuff. And, and that's just unfair. It, it, it actually hurts the ecosystem and it hurts innovation. Um, so Spotify cannot even advertise that they have, that you can buy audio books, you know, uh, on, on the, on their, their iOS app um, outside of the Apple app. And they have to charge more. Same thing with Epic Games uh, right there as well. So the problem, the, so to kind of put a bow on this, the fact that they have, they, they, they create the marketplace and they participate in the marketplace is they're both the umpire and they're the pitcher and batter inside this. And it's, it's patently unfair. Furthermore, it exasperates the issues of privacy because they, they're, they, they've locked in the marketplace that they don't have to compete for features and functions that, that actually add more privacy. I mean, Google has had so many hack. I mean, not Google, I'm sorry, scratch that. Meta in 2019 had some major hacks going on. But the problem is, is that people are not migrating off, in, in, even after all the, the, the hacks that happen right there, because they're lo you're locked in. So there's also the fact that they're, they're not open ecosystems and um, third parties can't um, interoperate with them as well. So that's another aspect of as well. So people are locked in and they have to suffer through weaker privacy because of that. So the monopoly issues, not only stop competition um, and, uh, and and stifle innovation um, and take off a lot of money off the top, like in the Google ad system, because they, they sell the ads and they place the ads that people statistically said that, hey, this is much more expensive to do you know online advertising because of that. But it exasperates the situation of cybersecurity. It exasperates the situation as it relates to privacy because there's no alternatives that that force these people to do a better job as it relates to privacy because we're all locked into this as well so so yeah you can't ignore the fact that these are they these are large monopolies um and if you really want to address some of the core concerns you have about data collection and ai you also have to make the marketplace more competitive than, than it currently is Wow, a lot to think. Definitely, definitely a lot to think. And uh, of course, we, we could talk uh, and go deeper in certain topics, and I'm sure you do that on the book. So I don't want to give away everything. <laughs> but I, I, I think uh, it will be easy to say that this is a, a kind of podcast episode that I like to record, because if there is something 
that is going to happen when people listen to this, which happened to me, it gives you a lot of thoughts, a lot of question, and make you think uh, really heavy about all our everyday things. I mean, I, I started to think about the phone that I use, the apps that I use, and you know, the privacy that you have make me think about GDPR. And and literally, I talk to my dad sometimes, and he is in his 80s, and he's like, I can't go anywhere anymore because. And always the cookies, and I already told them that I, <laughs> I don't want them. But they ask me again. I'm like, Dad, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, you know that's what it is. But again, I think these are relevant topics again for our rights, our humanity, the way we interact together, and definitely thoughts about the economy, and um, yeah, and democracy. I mean, you touched that. There is there is way to weaponize as a I'm stealing something, I'm doing something bad, and then really in a subtle way, you manipulate social engineer people pretty much to to do things that maybe they wouldn't think they would do. And, and nobody really signed up for that. I think I didn't. You yeah, didn't. I, I think it's, look, at the end of the day, we have such a concentration of power in, in, in a few companies, right? And they, they've yeah. created amazing products, et cetera. Um, but I don't think it's healthy to have such concentration of, of power where, you know, they, they have 4 billion users. That's half the world's population. And there's no alternative, viable alternatives uh, to them as well. So it's just it's not healthy for democracy. And in the past, in the in the U.S., you know, there was the, the railroad trust and we we, we mm -hmm. broke them up um, and then we, we put in regulation and then the same thing with standard oil and the oil and we made a more competitive economy. And the problem is, is that the privacy, we don't have a federal privacy law, but the privacy laws that we have, HIPAA, Graham, Leach, Bliley, et cetera, they were all done in the 90s before iPhone, before Google, before Meta. And now most healthcare data, as I said before, is is kind of floating around in mobile apps. It's not, you know, with your doctor, et cetera. And so we need to take a HIPAA for sensitive healthcare information and we need to update it for the modern digital world, et cetera. So we, we need to do things like that as well. And so I, I try to put in this book that, you know, explain what the problems are. I try to connect the docs, dots between over collection of data, how AI uses it and how the concentration of power makes these problems worse. But I try to provide some simple solutions like I talked about before, like the global privacy control, the equivalent uh, delete act, which is a do not call registry. I talked about AI transparency. I'm like, dudes, there's some actually pretty simple things we can do to increase mm -hmm. transparency to uh, facilitate the ability for us to control uh, data, um, our data, and how it's being used. Um, and so we could actually start, you know, taking back control. Um, and I'm not trying to, you know, hurt big tech or kill it or anything like that. But I think we can, you know, you know, better regulate it, better contain the the negative and, and uh, you know, and just and have more of the positive things, you know, stand out as well. And so, and that's based on me starting tech companies and, and doing this for, you know, cyber and privacy for 20 years. And a lot of your yeah. listeners, they know, they know that there is a cybersecurity problem. There's too much data. <laughs> they know it needs to be better protected. Uh, yeah. But so why can't, the you know the the policies and regulations reflect what your listeners know which is we need to do more yeah and we need to be more active and again the only way to do it is understand what what we're doing every day so i i'm sure this is a book for for everyone that is interested in in, in understanding this and maybe an inspiration for uh, entrepreneurs as well as everyday user as well as maybe regulators uh, that may understand that there are easy solutions because in the end, you just need to want it to do things. You know, yeah. like John Lennon yeah, said, and, 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 if, we, if we want a peace, if we all wanted a peace, we will have peace. But we all want TV, and we all have TV. <laughs> and that was back well, in I, the sixties. So, yeah, I think I don't I think know what you would have said now. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I look. Yeah, I, I think the key thing is what I'm trying to do with the book is first 
raise awareness, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's clear. that's and con and connect the dots right there. And then, yeah, if I can influence people right there, um, you know, that that's that's great. So, um, yeah, that that's that's what we're tr we're trying to do here. Well, I, I found this conversation to be very enlightening, and again, I'm, I'm sure that the audience will think about it. Uh, there'll be notes in the podcast notes and in the YouTube video, if that's what you're watching, on how to get in touch with Tom. Uh, in, there is a website. His website. I know, Tom, you didn't touch on that, but I know you write a ton of blogs, a lot of content that I'm sure it's still part of your thinking process that then culminated into writing this book. And so I invite everybody to check it out. There is the opportunity to get the book right there. And uh, as far as I am concerned, Tom, thank you so much. And uh, everybody stay tuned on Red Defining Society podcast. And yeah, subscribe. There will still be more, more stories. And again, Tom, thank you so much. Thank you very much as well, Mark. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.